ladies and gentlemen who is attending uh, is uh, achieving good results. Uh, let's get started. The, uh, the second session, we have two speakers. And I, as I understand, I'm asking again because the people are coming right now. Agata Klechkowska. Ah, you are here. So please come, come because you are a discussant. Two discussants here. So we have uh, two speakers, Dr. Patricia Grzebik, and she will be the first one because they agreed the, uh, the order. And Professor Sigmar Stadmleyer, he will give you a surprise. What kind of surprise? I will not mention because, because if I will mention, there will be no surprise. And afterwards, I ask the discussants. Uh, discussants have maximum 10 minutes for your um, uh, intervention. I'm also asking those who are, who are uh, still with us from the previous uh, uh, Professor Eden, Professor uh, Henderson, if you wish to join in the discussion or you have the questions, you are kindly welcome. Now, without further ado, let's get started. Uh, Dr. Patricia Grzebik, please, the floor is yours. The rule is the same, 15 to 17 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to start from the one statement because in the previous presentations there were many references to the term of aggression, to the uh, war of aggression, crime of aggression. And, uh, but also uh, at the beginning I would like to emphasize that uh, sometimes we use the um, argument, for example, from Geneva Conventions concerning Article 2, that um, the occupation which meets even no resistance is still uh, international armed conflict. But I would be very careful with mixing a law of armed conflict with uh, a law on use of force as um, the first additional protocol of uh, 1977 directly states that the application of law of armed conflict should not impact qualification according to the use of force. And that's why we decided to change uh, um, uh, to change our roles because my uh, presentation um, um, sticks much more to the previous presentations because it talks about uh, more definition of aggression and uh, why I wanted to focus on um, uh, qualification of a situation uh, in Crimea as an aggression in the light of this definition because I think that we really owe this to Russia. Why? For three reasons. Firstly, the Ru this was Russia, uh, which uh, was so much involved in the adoption of the first treaty defining aggression. I mean, uh, London Conventions of uh, 1933. And uh, we even can say that uh, because of this involvement, Russia... Uh, 1933. Um, because of this involvement, Russia even attempted to cre create some regional custom. But unfortunately, Russia also violated this uh, treaty almost against uh, all its uh, signatories. So that's why we cannot say that uh, really we had this uh, customary rule established at that time. And then this was Russia, this was Soviet Union, uh, which insisted on the inclusion of aggression into UN Charter, despite the the opposition on behalf of United States or United Kingdom. And then this was Soviet Union, which was so involved in defining aggression within United Nations framework, uh, proposed, uh, uh, it uh, proposed many uh, definitions of aggression, but they were quite similar to this, which, which we could observe in the London uh, uh, Convention of 1933. And, uh, of course, um, um, I would like to refer in my, in my statement to the definition uh, from the General Assembly Resolution of uh, 3314. And there was a question in previous uh, session if uh, this resolution could be considered as a reflection of uh, customary law. Um, I can say that, uh, well, this definition is not satisfying for, sat for states, and they were expressing their um, dissatisfaction. But uh, from 1974, nobody managed to um, figure out some better definition. And the proof is, for example, the uh, amendments to the ICC statute that even after um, uh, 30, uh, over 30 years, still states decided that there is nothing better than this definition of 1974. Um, why we should, or if 
it is needed to, um, to qualify situation in Crimea as an aggression. Well, we can say that it is completely useless because um, the United Nations Charter prohibits any um, uh, use of force against uh, Article 2.4. So there is no need to uh, qualify a situation as aggression as any use of force uh, in contradiction of uh, two, uh, two Section 4 of UN Charter is prohibited. And secondly, uh, you can use self-defense in response to the armed attack. But remember that in the French version, this armed attack is uh, defined as aggression armé. So it's not without relevance, this definition of aggression. And uh, thirdly, well, the measures which uh, Security Council can undertake in response um, uh, to aggression are exactly the same if we talk about breach of peace or threat to peace. And we know that threat to peace is so uh, broad term that even now in, uh, encompass contagion of Ebola or climate changes. So, um, and also the studies of many scholars show that um, uh, not only aggression is considered as a peremptory norm, as Yuskoga's norm, but also other violations of Article 2, Section 4 are considered as a, per as a peremptory um, norms. So that's why these consequences which uh, were present in uh, the presentations of my predecessors, like uh, uh, the obligation to not recognize the situation, the uh, in, uh, state responsibility of uh, aggressor, but also responsibility of international community in response to, uh, to violation of peremptory norms and responsibility also of international organizations are exactly the same. But this qualification of aggression could be useful from other reasons. Firstly, if we want to consider the issue of individual responsibility for aggression, firstly, we must state if there was a state aggression. So we cannot just jump into uh, the um, discussion on jurisdiction of the ICC or jurisdiction of Russian or Ukrainian courts because we remember that uh, according to criminal codes of Russia and Ukraine, their courts are entitled to prosecute war of aggression. And uh, also, aggression is, and it was cited in previous session, uh, is considered as this uh, most serious and dangerous form of the illegal use of force. So that's why um, many scholars argue that this is what we have in uh, Resolution 3314. These are, in fact, the examples of armed attacks. Just uh, so uh, we, we cannot imagine the situation that uh, in response to this, what we have in 3314, we cannot use, for example, self-defense. And also with uh, the term of aggression, we have some kind of um, an odium that this uh, term mobilizes international community. If we just say that the uh, law on use of force was violated, this is not very um, attractive to media. But if you just say that there was aggression, this really triggers the um, media attention and the uh, attention of international community. And also in uh, many documents, including Resolution 3314, it is emphasized that uh, no territorial acquisition of special advantage resulting from aggression uh, shall not be recognized as lawful. So um, the problem with the definition of aggression, which was noticed from the very beginning of the works on this definition, was that, this defi that every definition could be considered as some kind of signpost for aggressor. Every aggressor would claim that he is acting in self-defense. And uh, Russia used this um, uh, also in its argumentation because, um, firstly, when you look at the chapeau of the definition, you would find out that uh, uh, we have several elements which uh, we have to find in the situation to say that there was a um, um, that there was an aggression. So first we must say that there was use of armed force. And uh, of course this uh, no victims issue was raised in this, um, uh, um, in, uh, in this room. But I would like to also remind that among the acts which are um, enumerated in um, resolution 3314, there is not only attack on armed force, but there is also attack of territory. So you can use force not only against people, but you can use against the territory. And uh, previously, before the Crimea, there was no doubt that if uh, armed forces just advance, just take by surprise the other state, and they stop, and they are waiting for the, uh, for the reaction, we have no doubt who is aggressor in that situation. So there, is no blur there are no blurred lines here. We know that th those who use first, use uh, uh, their forces, they are aggressors, not the other one. And um, 
Also, uh, with this no victim uh, issue, I would like to also remind that uh, according to uh, Nuremberg judgments, the annexation of Czechoslovakia, annexation of Austria was considered as acts of aggression. And also, I, um, I remember well that Russia um, confirmed, okay, for example, our action against Poland or against Finland could be considered as acts of aggression, but not as war of aggression. And war of aggression is a crime against peace which uh, should be penalized. And this was also, this argumentation was adopted by Nuremberg Tribunal. But in subsequent um, uh, trials uh, before American, uh, American tribunals, it, if I like, for example, in Minnesota, Ministries uh, trial, it was said that no, uh, Czechoslovakia, um, uh, Austria, this was just steps in aggression and should be penalized at the same um, level. And uh, also the, uh, the problem that, uh, so we have use of armed force, then we have that it should be done by a state. So um, this all also remarks about the green people who are without state insignias, that there were no Russians there. Well, we know that uh, we can just use the uh, test of uh, effective control established by um, uh, International Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, also that um, in uh, many statements, like for example in London Convention, Russia insisted that in this case when there is a, um, um, when we violate international boundaries, if, we, if our actions are overt or covert, direct or indirect, in all these cases we should talk about aggression. But also what is important is that about aggression we can talk only if it is inconsistent with the UN Charter. And Russia used all arguments, um, the, uh, the question of the self-defense, so de to defend its own citizens, but also of preventive self-defense, if they were talking about this possible NATO base in Crimea. And also the, uh, in um, Russian scholars' um, um, publication, we can also see some rejected ideas, like the concept of use of force in defense of cultural genocide, like we could observe, for example, in the publication of uh, my predecessor, Wolstik. And uh, uh, the issue of gravity, I think that in the situation when there is the territorial, territorial acquisition of the territory of another state, there is no doubt that the gravity has had, uh, reached this level that we can talk about uh, the aggression. In case of uh, uh, Crimea, we can just uh, enlighten uh, such acts of aggression like uh, the invasion uh, of the territory of another state, the blockade of the ports or coasts, that there was, um, for example, this incident with um, um, sinking Russian, the own Rus uh, submarine vessels to block uh, the Ukrainian um, uh, marine fleet, and then the use of armed force against the uh, agreements, um, and also the sending of um, uh, descending um, of uh, its own troops to another state. But what is also emphasized in many publications that maybe we do not have moral norms to complain about Russia attitude because we could observe violations of the law on use of force on behalf of United States, on behalf of NATO. And uh, this, um, th this doctrine of trans-imperial policy of Russia could be considered as some kind of variation of this what we could observe as hegemonic international national law. This was this idea which was proposed by American scholars that if some country like United States is a hegemon, it has another approach to international law. So the now scholars, they just uh, emphasize that we, uh, if you propose such such ideas, such approach to international law, you must be prepared that in few months, few years, some other state would use it. And um, uh, so when we are complaining that the international law is not a democratic one, I would say that now we can say that international law starts to be more and more communistic because all states are equal, but some states are equal more in this case. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stratification uh, everywhere, wh wherever you look for. Ladies and gentlemen, now this promise surprised Professor Sigmar Stadelmeier is, uh, like all of us, a research scholar 
but also a pilot. And uh, his presentation will be a refreshment for us. We deserve it. Even if the content of his presentation is not a refresh one. So uh, from the audience side, you can feel yourself in Air Force One, but it doesn't mean that you are safe. Uh, Professor Steitmaler, uh, he will present uh, something different that was presented until now. This, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, let me first of all express my gratitude to the organizers of this conference for inviting me to come here and talk about this uh, sad topic. Uh, it has already been mentioned today that uh, someone, it was uh, Oleks Moskayenko, uh, mentioning the skies over Donetsk, uh, and that reminded us of the fact that the, that the Ukrainian affair is not limited to Crimea, unfortunately. Uh, my job is an easy one. On the one hand, we, ha we only so far have a preliminary report of what happened, so I can restrict myself to preliminary conclusions. Uh, what we know is very simple. Uh, Malaysian Airlines 17, that's not the one lost in the Pacific or any other ocean, that's the one shot down over Donetsk. Malaysian 17 came down because it was hit by a large number of high energy objects, detonated, ahead and above the aircraft, penetrating the outer fuselage as well as the cockpit floor from above to below. That is fully consistent with the detonation of a fragmentation warhead triggered by a proximity fuse. So far, so good, but that describes every, each and every air-to-air -air missile as well as each and every surface-to-air missile, which I know. So that tells us nothing other than it was shot down. It especially does not tell us by whom. Now the problem when discussing this is uh, this uh, presentation would not have fit easily into any of the headlines uh, given by the organizers. It involves a law of armed conflict. It does involve air law, which comes into, into it because of the very nature of the activity we are talking about. And it also involves different kinds of responsibility. So let's go through the things one at a time. First of all, the main instrument governing aviation, and I understand that you're, most of you, you know, almost all of you are international lawyers specializing in armed conflict, but not all of you specializing in aviation, so I have reproduced a number of texts. So the key provision in this context is Article 3 B of the Chicago Convention, which reiterates the obvious, namely that force should not be used against civil aircraft. So, should it have been the Ukrainians who shot down Malaysian 17, it's a clear violation of the Chicago Convention period. The consequences of which are likewise clear. Should there be any dispute, it would be for resolution of the ICAO Council. Should there be any dispute about that or any appeal, it could go either to the ICJ or to a, an, an, an ad hoc arbitration tribunal to be composed according to the rules of the Chicago Convention. Apart from that, it's a clear-cut case of state responsibility if things happened like this. If not, if separatist forces were the ones who shot it down, it becomes slightly more difficult as the Chicago Convention obviously is binding upon states only. In order to, to hold the Russian Federation accountable for it, it would have to be demonstrated that those forces were acting under effective control of the Russian Federation. And I choose the, the famous uh, uh, Nicaragua versus US formula of effective control, as that one seems to be the most appropriate one for me under that context. Now, uh, what about individual responsibility as apart from state responsibility. Again, we have a special convention as far as aviation is concerned. It was concluded in 1971 in Montreal. And please do not mix it up with another Montreal convention from the 90s who tells you how much you will get when your bag gets lost. That's a different one. Uh, it states that uh, any person commits uh, an offense who in whatever way destroys an aircraft in service, and that is what has happened here. 
all signatories to the Montreal Convention, and that includes both the Russian Federation and Ukraine, are under a legal obligation to insert into their criminal codes penal provisions to that end. As far as jurisdiction is concerned, it rests with the territorial state, this is Ukraine, and uh, uh, is in, uh, in, in, in competition, should we say, with the, with, the, with the jurisdiction of the state of registry of the aircraft. The aircraft concerned had the registration Nina Mike, Mike Romeo Delta, which uh, makes it a Malaysian one. And even should it have been an aircraft on lease from another nation, Definitely the operator was Malaysia, as the whole crew was Malaysian. The next question is, could it have been foreseen? Should there have been taken precautionary measures? Now, there is a provision in the Chicago Convention, which is a somewhat balanced thing. There is no thing in the Chicago Convention which absolutely requires precautionary measures to protect civil aviation, but there is a provision which uh, gives an option to safeguard both security interests of the state overflown and safety interests, please note the difference between security and safety, and safety difference of aviation. So this more or less is a balance to be, uh, to be achieved by the territorial state. We may find this surprising. Uh, after all, the Chicago Convention was adopted in order to promote the safe and orderly development of aviation, as its preamble tells us, and then we see something like this. We do have additional points in the annexes to the Convention, and here I just have to lose one word. Uh, those annexes are not technically annexes, such as attachments to a treaty, they are just designated for convenience, as the Convention says, as annexes. Actually, they are secondary legislation adopted by ICAO of a rather soft nature. Because you can deviate from them whenever you like, all you have to do is notify ICAO. So far, so good. The bad news is, when you do so and drop below ICAO's standards, your licenses, certificates of airworthiness, whatever is based on your national air law will no longer be recognized by other nations. As that is useless in aviation, states think twice before they deviate. What do the annexes say? Well, not too many useful things. Uh, aircraft shall not be flown in a prohibited area. Surprise, surprise, that's why it's called a prohibited area. Uh, coordination of, with potentially hazardous activities is the job of the territorial state. <clears throat> Prohibited areas should be properly uh, identified and delineated and designated. The most important single thing is to be found in Annex 17, which is concerned with security. That is, uh, defense against external threats to aviation of whatever kind that includes but is not limited to terrorism. And here we have that principle we've been looking for, which says that each contracting state shall have as its primary objective the safety of passengers, crew, ground personnel, and the general public in all matters relating to safeguard against acts of unlawful interference. That is exactly what has happened here. Now, what could we have done to prevent this? Why not close the airspace? You will note, first of all, that, that the flight path of MH17 passed almost right overhead Warsaw. And you will also see that uh, at that time, there were different areas of airspace closed to uh, aircraft. Uh, obviously, as a result of a, of a Ukrainian threat assessment of weapon systems available and their range. And you can see that the airspace was closed up to and including uh, 32,000 feet. And you see that Malaysian 17 was traveling at 33,000. And there was another flight in the area that day, a Singapore Airlines flight, which, which also approached at 33,000 and then climbed to 35,000 on request of air traffic control to provide separation and avoid collision. For those of you not familiar with long-range flying, you would not normally cruise at a uniform flight level all the time from Warsaw to New York, 
but what you would do what is called a step climb procedure. The more fuel you burn, the lighter you get, the higher you can climb. And the levels assigned to you are not just at your discretion. There is what is called a semicircular rule. In short, if you go eastbound, you take odd thousands. If you go westbound, you take even thousands. Exceptions subject to permission of air traffic control. So that is what ATC did here. They separated them vertically, keeping them as high as possible, as operationally possible, that is, depending on the weight of an aircraft. Remember, we are talking about two Boeing 777s. The Singaporean one was a 777 as well. Who could close the airspace? Could ICAO do it? And Ukraine is a member of ICAO. No, they could not. ICAO is concerned with coordination, with setting of standards, with the distribution of information. I will show you an example in a minute. There is a regional thing called the European Civil Aviation Conference, and Ukraine is a member of that one too. ICAC, likewise, is concerned with regional coordination, with regional standards, but not with actual operational air traffic control. What about Euro, the famous Eurocontrol? Ukraine is a member of that one too. It has similar tasks. The only area in which Eurocontrol is operational, that is Maastricht Upper Airspace Center, and that includes the Benelux countries and northern Germany only. So that leaves again Ukraine and, let's not forget this, let's not forget common sense, a constant threat assessment by operators, by airlines, and ultimately by air crew. That too is part of the responsibility of a captain. Now, how would this action by ICAO look like? I've, I've shown you the facsimile here just as an example. I don't expect you to read it. Uh, the important thing is, this is what ICAO does notifying national aviation authorities that there is a dangerous situation, in that case overhead Libya, overhead Tripoli, the result of which will be a so-called NOTAM, that stands for Notice to Airmen, issued by the national aviation authorities informing operators and pilots that it is hazardous to fly overhead Tripoli. And that's, it's for them now to draw their own conclusions. And if you want to live, you don't fly there. Brings us back to the, the type of situation that was going on at that time. We are certainly in accordance that there was an armed conflict going on. Now, for the purposes of this presentation, I am happy to be able to leave open, whether it was an international or a non-international one, precisely because that key principle of protection of civilians is applicable in both. Uh, you're, you're all familiar with the concepts and I, I suffice it to tell you that Ukraine is a party to the Geneva Conventions and both additional protocols and so is the Russian Federation. That last bullet was somehow lost in transmission, it would seem. Now, as I said, the principle of protection of civilians applies in both types of conflicts and there is ample evidence of the UN Security Council to uh, under, underline and highlight that. Resolutions from 1990, 2000 and all above the famous responsibility to protect resolution from 2006. Especially the letter says that parties to armed conflict are responsible uh, to ensure protection of civilians and that deliberate targeting of civilians is a no-go item, as we say in aviation. You just can't do that. And that finds its uh, result in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, making this a war crime in international and non-international conflict alike. Now, finally, you could tell me, well, it might have been a targeting error. They might have been, they might have been thinking they are shooting at something else. Ladies and gentlemen, this is no longer 1998, the Iranian Airbus and USS Vincennes. Things have changed since those days. And uh, just a second before you hit that uh, button, uh, your children may well be aware of that website more than you are perhaps, because every child on the internet knows www.flightradar24.com. Now if you open that page, what you get and now please keep your fingers crossed for me that we do get it. 
what you get is this. It centers around the area where it is called up, so that is Warsaw, and if you just click one aircraft at random, you get all of the data read out from an ADS-B transponder which those aircraft carry. Please forget what you heard about radar in your school days. It is no longer primary radar sending out an impulse and waiting for a primary echo. It is sending out an interrogation signal to which an onboard device in the aircraft responds with, yes, I am here, adding certain data, including the call sign, including the flight level, and including any other details useful for air traffic control. Anyone who has connection to the internet can check the target area for civilian targets. So don't ever tell me it was a targeting error. This concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I provide even some extra time because uh, this was a kind of a refreshment even, even if the content was different. And I didn't want, for obvious reason, to shoot him because it would be unpolite on many respects. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, now we have two, as according to the program, designated discussants. Uh, and afterwards, we still will have, I hope, non-designated discussants, especially that after this last presentation, there's uh, thousands of questions open, I suppose. So let's go first to the lady, Agata Kleczkowska, approximately 10 minutes for your uh, presentation and uh, voice. Thank you very much. Uh, the primary subject of my presentation was how to, not to wage wars, but just use force. The evolution of terminology connected with warfare, but as I understand, I need to keep it short, so I will limit myself it's as much as possible. Um, well, in everyday language, we sometimes tend to use the word war as a flexible expression suitable for an allusion to any serious strife, struggle or campaign. That is how notions how like war against terrorism or wars against narcotic drugs appeared. Nevertheless, the term war is of course not just political or journalistic one, but first and foremost, it is a term of serious legal inclinations. And uh, throughout centuries, many definitions of war were created, making, uh, of course, impossible referring to all of them. Uh, however, I would like to attempt to mention at least a few of them and classify them a bit. So I will start with defining what war is, and then I will proceed on to the terms which are used nowadays. Uh, so I classified the definitions connected with war uh, into two groups. The first group focused on naming parties to the war. Thus, Grotius, in his Opus on the Law of War and Peace, divides wars into public and private ones, whereas uh, private wars are conflicts which are carried out by private persons, and public wars are the ones which are carried out and against people handling the supreme power in the country. Uh, that is, the conflict is quoted, which is made on each side by the authority of the civil power, unquoted. And only public wars are governed by the uh, law of nations, and to wage public war, uh, the two prerequisites must be met, quoted, first that it be made on both sides by the authority of those that have the sovereign power in that state, and then that it be accompanied with some formalities, unquoted. Another definition, another famous definition, was formulated by Oppenheim. According to him, quoted, war is a contention between two or more states through their armed forces for the purposes of overpowering each other and imposing such conditions of peace as the victor places. Thus, this definition contains four elements. First of all, that war is a contention between two or more states. Secondly, that it involves use of armed forces. Thirdly, that it is a contention which is aimed at overpowering the other side of the conflict. And fourthly, that each party of the conflict has the same goal, but of course the interests of the parties to the conflict are opposite. Uh, Oppenheim in his treatise The Future of International Law also cites Rousseau by noting that war is not a relation of man to man, but a relation of states in which private persons are enemies only accidentally, not as men but as soldiers. Thus, from this definition, we can see that war was understood as a conflict between uh, states, no, not like a conflict or contention between non-state actors or private persons. The second group of definitions is more focused on underlying the state of relations between belligerents and their will. Uh, thus, for instance, Verdross uh, called the war the state of force between states with suspension to peaceful relations. 
Clausewitz, referring to the will of state, say that war is an act of force to compel our enemy to do our will. Uh, thus, a war was deemed as a contention between, first of all, states, secondly, with the use of militaries, and thirdly, disrupting peaceful relations. Uh, none of the, of the above-mentioned definitions come from the 20th century. What can somehow explain why none of the above-mentioned authors mentioned uh, the illegality of, uh, of war or use of force in general? But as we know, for centuries, use of bellum was, uh, was considered to be the inherent right of every state, so states could wage a war, and only the First World War changed this approach. And the framers of the new post-war order wanted to uh, re rearrange the international relations, basing them on the idea that the peace is the normal state of interstate relations, and uh, war is an exception to it. And this approach was followed with uh, new regulations uh, on war, and uh, to put it more precisely, on war, on prohibiting the war. Uh, the two most important acts of the time, the Covenant of the League of Nations and the Paris Pact, in some circumstances prohibited the war, and focused, as it was uh, in the case of Covenant, on the uh, peaceful settlement of disputes. And this atmosphere made using the word war very and popular, suggesting the unlawfulness of the, uh, of the undertaking actions. But states, instead of uh, complying with these regulations, uh, simply started to rename uh, the undertaking actions. And it was all possible because of lack of precision of terms uh, used at that time. Just to give an example, uh, the covenant prohibited wars, but didn't, for instance, mention the reprisal. So states could uh, wage regular wars, not calling it wars, but calling it, for instance, uh, reprisals. Um, and it was all possible also because states <coughs> self-labeled the, uh, the undertaking actions. Uh, on the other hand, the Paris Pact, for instance, prohibited war as an instrument of national policy, uh, thus allowing waging wars as, for example, upholding general community values. Um, to put it shortly, precision seemed to be the key in stopping states from uh, waging bloody conflicts and, um, con and uh, not considering war as a normal um, way of dealing with international relations, no matter how the scene has been changed by the Paris Pact and the Covenant. And the significant changes to this approach were brought uh, by the uh, Second World War and uh, by the Charter. Uh, thus, a charter refers to the notion of war uh, actually only once in its preamble, uh, saying that the peoples of the United Nations are determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind. And uh, apart from this, there is no mention, there is no reference to the war in the charter. There are also there, there are references to some specific terms which are broadly used nowadays. Thus, we can say that the term war has been replaced by the notions like self-defense, use of force, hostilities, resort to arm for, for arms, uh, police action, peace enforcement, and others. And the, two, two of these, self-defense and prohibition of use of force, are regulated by a charter. However, it has to be noted that, of course, they are also recognized by the customary law rules. Uh, of course, use of force, it was already mentioned by uh, Professor Tangredi and Dr. Henderson, are, um, are referred to in Article 2, uh, Paragraph 4 of the Charter. Uh, but and bearing in mind the impre impreciseness of the word war and the quite precision of the all other notions which are used today, we can say that the term use of force is the broadest of the terms which are used today. The, there, it is the most vague of them all. Uh, and the United Nations system isn't aimed at prohibiting the use of force at all, but rather to uh, control its use under the auspices of the Security Council. And it is said that the Charter envisages two exceptions to the use of force, namely uh, the self-defense and the action under Article 42 of the Charter. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the other term which is used by the Charter, from the arm attack, seems much more specific. And as it was already stated uh, in, previous, um, in, in previous papers, uh, we can say that an, uh, not every use of uh, that an arm attack uh, is a serious form of use of force with serious consequences such as trespass on the territory of the third state, fatalities, destruction of properties of considerable scale, and uh, it was all stated, at least what already said by the um, ICJ. And the term arm attack appears in the charter in the context of self-defense, but um, 
Of course, now I should refer to the extensive literature and uh, notions connected with arm attack and cell defense, uh, but um, I wanted just to refer to one aspect of it. Uh, well, after ICJ, it is worth noting that uh, arm attack needs to be understood not merely as an action by regular armed forces across an international border, but also descending on behalf of a state of armed bands, groups, irregulars, or mercenaries. And this last part of the uh, definition or the uh, characteristic of an arm attack mentioned by the ICJ is actually part of the definition of aggression enacted by the uh, UN General Assembly, which shows how all these terms overlap each other. And there's uh, also another aspect uh, of war, which I would like to discuss very shortly, uh, namely the declarations uh, of war. And nowadays, um, the issue of declaration of war is no, it's not so important as it was previously as uh, war is illegal. Nevertheless, international law didn't explicitly exclude um, uh, declarations of war and a state starting uh, armed conflict or any other any contention with another state can issue declaration to um, to name uh, the undertaking actions but of course in no way such a declaration would um, make the unlawful action the lawful one uh, but in majority of instances uh, states uh, in act actually undertake actions and the factual actions are the start of the contention and uh, we can say that because uh, both actual actions and declarations of war are made by states and they have the same goal that is to establish a warfare between the states or the disruption of peaceful relation, we can say that factual actions are actually some form of uh, formal declarations of war. To refer to the lawful cases of uh, use of war, uh, according to the Charter, uh, we can say that uh, we should know that the Charter doesn't require any kind of declarations issued to the other party, no matter if we talk about the self-defense or if we talk about um, actions undertaken under Article 42 of the Charter. And uh, to sum up, uh, the term war seems hardly applicable today, taking into consideration the variety of much more precise and sophisticated notions which are uh, named in many uh, legal regulations. We can imagine a situation when um, a, a state reports to the Security Council that it will use the inherent right of self-defense because another state starts waging war against it. It is very imprecise and if the state would use the term uh, arm attack, we would be more in, uh, it would be easier to assess the legality uh, of uh, undertaking actions. Uh, thus, these, all these terms which are used uh, nowadays in legal act uh, are actually helping states in uh, defining and justifying their actions as the legal one, uh, basing on the characteristics of each type of use of force which are mentioned in uh, legal regulations. Thank you. Thank you very much, more or less like another presentation, not typical discussant. The final designated discussant is Dr. Mindy Avashmazi. I understand he is a mixture formally linked to Germany, uh, by heart linked to Georgia, so uh, let's... I'm uh, in Germany, but I'm Georgian. Uh, okay, so it's a per perfect mixture, let's uh, have his presentation. Thank Ten you, Chair. Twelve minutes, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, um, the concept of uh, protecting nationals abroad by means of military force <coughs> was one of the initial legal arguments uh, of the Russian Federation in the United Nations Security Council. Um, and I'm going to talk about this um, concept. I argued in this paper, in my presentation, that the concept is too broad and flexible. Um, it, is, um, it allows the use of force in a great number of uh, situations. It is hardly in accordance with uh, international law, as it stands today. And it does not contribute to changing the law on the use of force and non-intervention. And finally, it does not set uh, the Russian rules of game in the post-Soviet space, does not create a regional customary law. I'm trying to explain this in uh, three basic uh, steps. 
First, I want to talk about the evolution of this concept of the protection of nationals. And I'm discussing um, the use of the concept in military doctrines and foreign policy concepts of the Russian Federation. Second, I'm discussing the use, the application of the concept in practice. And here I'm talking about five cases. First, um, Baltic states. Um, second, the use of concept with respect to separatist conflicts in Georgia. Uh, third, Transnistria, Moldova. Uh, then, uh, use of uh, this doctrine in Georgia in 2008. And finally, um, Ukraine. And um, I'm also talking about international reactions uh, in this context. And finally, uh, in the final section of my presentation, I'm talking about uh, international uh, implications, about the implications uh, for international law and uh, practice. I will try um, to limit myself to 10 minutes. And as you all know, the concept uh, of the protection of nationals is uh, contested, still contested in international law. It's um, not uh, settled whether um, uh, it remains controversial whether lowering the threshold of self-defense to protect nationals by force is accepted as an admissible legal justification for the use of force, or whether it constitutes a standalone right um, in international law. Uh, Thomas Frank noted in 2002 that this concept remains indeterminate. Now, when it comes to the evolution of this concept in Russian policy uh, context, well, first I want to mention that the Soviet Union was, uh, uh, Soviet Union rejected the application of the concept as uh, uh, Christina Gray emphasized in her study on the use of force. Uh, there is some lack of clarity as to the uh, Soviet Union's position during the Soviet period. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, as you know, uh, there was a shift uh, towards more assertive foreign policy with respect to the countries of the so-called Near Abroad, and this shift occurred in uh, 1992 under the rule of President Eltsin and his foreign minister Kozirev, who stated already in 92 that the protection of Russian minorities in the Near Abroad was Russia's duty and range of measures should be applied to achieve this aim, including the use of military force under certain circumstances. Um, what is interesting here is that uh, an immediate reaction followed by the former Soviet republics. For instance, the Estonian foreign ministry issued a statement already at the time that, um, according to the statement, this constituted a threatening threat of the use of force from the Russian side. Lithuania simply emphasized that Russia's statement was not compatible with the norms, with norms of international law. What is interesting, there were negative reactions also from Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. Uh, on the other hand, the Latvian foreign minister regarded Kozirev's statement as a political rhetoric. The same applies to Kazakhstan. Its head of state also held this statement as electoral rhetoric issued to secure the support from government, uh, government critics. At the same time, the Speaker of the Crimean Parliament openly supported the statement of the Foreign Minister by announcing that Russian Federation should adopt measures according to international commitments protecting the rights of, of compatriots living on the territory of the Crimea and representing a national minority in Ukraine. This same, same applies also to separatist leaders in Georgia. Uh, well, um, I do not have much time, that's why I'm, I'm trying hardly to um, shorten my presentation. Um, I just mentioned in this context that Russian foreign policy concept of 2013 
recognize the protection of nationals as one of the main foreign policy goals of the Russian Federation. And it is interesting to note that Russia, according to this document, should promote Russian approaches towards protecting nationals in various contexts in the international sphere. Uh, the Russian military doctrine adopted in 2014 also enshrines this uh, doctrine and allows the use of force um, broadly um, to protect Russian citizens from uh, armed attack. Um, so this is a broad concept, um, flexible concept, which at first sight seems to be hardly in accordance with current international law. Um, one also should take into account the changing views, Russian views on modern warfare. Um, so the military philosophy of the leadership of Russian armed forces is very much uh, concerned with um, so-called uh, asymmetric warfare, uh, the role of non-state actors initiating armed conflicts, etc., etc. So this is the uh, context. Um, now, when it comes to law, domestic law of the Russian Federation, it also enshrines the doctrine of the use, uh, of, the use of force to protect nationals. First, the Russian Constitution, Article 61, Paragraph 2, and then the federal law on the state policy in regard to the uh, citizens residing abroad. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting that it's not limited to diplomatic protection. For instance, uh, Russian lawyer uh, Zorkin, um, Zorkin interpreted these provisions as authorizing Russia's use of force uh, against Georgia back in uh, 2008. Now, um, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the cases. Um, first, the application of doct doctrine in the Baltic states. Uh, President Eltsin and the Russian government stopped the withdrawal of Russian troops from the Baltic regions on several occasions, and the justification was that the rights of the Russian minority are not properly protected uh, in the Baltic states. Uh, second, um, in Georgia, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, uh, Russian President Yeltsin also issued a similar statement threatening to use, of for, uh, to, to use force um, in Abkhazia. Uh, and then uh, there was a Duma resolution issued in September 92. Now, um, uh, Transnistria, it's interesting that as according to the International Crisis Group, between 95 and 2002, the Duma passed more than 10 resolutions uh, supporting the application of this doctrine in Moldova, Transnistria. And in the course of the conflict in Ukraine, uh, 2014, uh, Dmitry Rogozin uh, emphasized that Russia will protect its citizens in Transnistria. So now I do not have time, much time to talk about Georgia 2008 and Ukraine. My colleagues discussed this here. I'm just, uh, I, I just want to emphasize that there was uh, international reaction uh, rejecting this uh, practice. I'm um, uh, elaborating more on this in my paper. And I just jump now to my conclusions. To my conclusions and what are the question, to my question, what are the legal implications of this practice? So, assessment of this practice between 92 and uh, 2015 uh, leads us to the conclusion that the protection of nationals has been invoked in many different contexts. And um, the form and the degree of the use of force or military pressure varies from case to case. There have been three main forms of the use of this doctrine to protect nationals. It has been applied in the context of direct military intervention, Georgia, Ukraine, continued presence of military bases, troops, on the territory of, of uh, the states, Baltic states, Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, and threats of application of military force, Baltic states, Moldia, Moldova, uh, Georgia, with respect to uh, Abkhazia. Well, um, at a higher political level, um, I must, uh, I, I must say that there is a continuous Russian claim 
to the right to protect nationals by military means. In 2008, President Medvedev stated that protecting the lives and interests of Russian citizens, wherever they are, is among the five principles of Russian foreign policy. This claim is underpinned by the respective legislation, as I mentioned before. One may even argue in this context that Russia is setting its role rules of game in the post-Soviet space. However, the conclusion of Oppenheim that intervention in the interest of the balance of power must obviously be excused since an equilibrium between the members of the family of nations is an indispensable condition of the very existence of international law, does not apply anymore under positive international law of the 21st century. And finally, I want to uh, emphasize that the Russian interpretation of the law on the use of force and non-intervention and its attempts to create its own set of rules for the near abroad was not explicitly shared by a large representative majority of states. Although international reactions remained rather work, uh, not clear, unclear in some instances, the reluctance of states to condemn the practice of the Russian Federation cannot be seen as based on legal considerations. In any case, such reluctance does not evidence the existence of opinion juris necessary to change customary law. And uh, I'm coming to my final uh, sentences. So there is no modification of customary law in this area. Violations of law cannot easily lead to a legal change. The high threshold for changing the law on the use of force, which also constitutes a peremptory norm of international law, has not been met. Protection of national structure remains a tool of hegemonic Russian foreign policy towards the countries of the former Soviet Union. Its application has not been regarded as a practice modifying norms of international law on the use of force and non-intervention. They just reflect evolving Russian power politics heavily based on the use of military force. Thank you very much.